Welcome to Running in the 70s, where we interview, meet, and get to know athletes of all kind who were running in the 70s. I'm your host, Matthew Kleinoski. Today on the podcast, we're back in Colorado. I only have so much time for this introduction, so I can't do everything. Here's somebody who not only was running in the 70s, but before, but he's nearly been running for almost 70 years. Everything on his running CV would fill me talking for the next hour. He started organizations. He ran everything from the 100-yard dash up to the marathon. A lot of coaching experience at the elite international level, Olympic coach. Welcome today on the podcast, Rich Castro. Hi, Rich. Good morning. Thank you, Matthew, for having me on. Great. Rich, let's talk way back your origin story. When, where, and how did you first get involved in running or sports of any kind? I go back to a track craze community called Laverne, uh, Southern California. Hotbed for sprinters and lots of different activities going on during the mid-50s. The reason I got involved with it was a local hero, a guy by the name of the Reverend Bob Richards. He was a two-time gold medalist in the pole vault. He uh, was multinational champion in the decathlon. In 56, I'm in grammar school. I'm walking by the grocery store and I see boxes of Wheaties in a display. I looked at it sideways. Then, lo and behold, Bob Richards is scheduled to speak at our school assembly. He talks about his experience winning his second gold medal in, in Melbourne. Then he starts talking about doing something in the community. And two things jump out. One, that afternoon, I'm out doing sprints. We have a grass track at our elementary school. The grass has got lined and burned into it. And I'm out doing 50-yard dashes. And one of the teachers popped out. So what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready for the Olympics. I got so <laughs> jazzed up from listening to the story. In any case, Bob Richards started a program called Junior Champs. He said, all the kids in the community are welcome to come out. It's going to be at the local college track. Come out. We're going to have all these track events. So it's free. I showed up. The sidebar to that experience is I'm lining up to go into the sprints because I thought I was quick and fast because I was very little as an elementary school kid. And the person tells me I can't run. And I I look at him. He says, "You, you don't have any shoes. So I said, okay. So I obviously was heartbroken and disappointed. And my house is about two or three blocks away from where I am. And we live on kind of the wrong side of the tracks in the community. I go back and I get the idea. I'm going to steal or borrow (laughs) my sister's tennis shoes. Back then, tennis shoes and, and a uniform were required to go to high school. So she's a freshman. I borrow her white pointed female tennis shoes and go back and do the long jump. And I won the long jump. So I didn't get the sprint. That got me started on running. I found out that I was fast as anybody in the community. We had teachers that were interested in promoting this. They had a grade school track team starting in fifth grade. So wow. that's how I got into it. Did your sister's shoes fit? Not really, but it was okay. I grew up very poor. And so I had a pair of dress keys that I had to put socks in the toes so I could get them to fit. That's great. It sounds like the community, and that was a great visit by the Olympian to inspire you. When did you get into real competitive athletics and what was it like in terms of coaching? And when did you move on to a track beyond grass? Through elementary school, we just competed in The idea was to do everything with the kids. I even have an 18 foot, six inch uh, shot put mark when I was in grammar school. We long jumped, we high jumped, we did everything, which was a great way of exposing kids to do it. Nobody pushed us, but we did competitions against other schools, but it was all fun. There was no real scores kept. We knew who was good and who wasn't. But I moved away from that community after eighth grade, and I was thrust into a rural high school setting in Northern California, didn't have any friends. The kids that knew me from introductions said, 
why don't you come out for the cross country team? And I had no idea what cross country was. I didn't know how far they ran, didn't know anything about it, but it was a way of meeting people. And it was primarily a Latino community. There were a lot of Asians, Italians, but multicultural. So that's became my conduit to becoming accepted and how to make friends that I knew school. I was a ninth grader, under hundred pounds, less than five feet tall. And we had a program called lightweights and that was us. We were so I was a lightweight cross country runner and it was all fun. We had a lot of good runners. What happened then was unfortunately the coach that was there got a DUI. So a new guy comes in, he's all gung ho. He decides he's going to take everything up a notch. He's a recent graduate of San Jose State, but he's a shot putter and discus thrower. No idea what he's doing with running. So he thrust us into an interval program. We're doing all kinds of things with running and just working our butts off. His goal is to break the school record of 514 in the mile for as many guys as he can. We do that. And... The team begins to gel. For me, it's all fun. This is the first time I've ever trained. So now we're training regularly, et cetera. And if you roll through it, four years later, this team goes undefeated, wins the uh, conference title. They don't have state competitions in 1964. The highest level we can get to is called the North Coast Sectional Championships. And I'm vacillating between the fourth, fifth, sixth man on the team as a senior. And lo and behold, we beat all kinds of teams much bigger than us. We finished third and I'm sold for life that this is it. But it was the biggest race I'd ever been. Peed in my pants at the start. And uh, 1964 is the time that I, it's the revelation. This is something I want to keep doing. Let me ask you about your ideas on competition you recall and view it as it was fun but competing against other schools your fourth fifth sixth man you had been accepted by the community so that you're friends with the kids and your teammates now so competitions fair game how did you view competitions because i was never the best guy on the team it was always fun to be part of something bigger than myself i remember when I finished that last meet, everybody was congratulating me because I had finished well and strong and I helped the team that day. All of a sudden I realized that's what it was really all about was us doing something together. It didn't really matter that Ron Chalmers had done really good and was up in the top. He couldn't have been anything if we hadn't finished in third place. And here is this small rural high school, uh, much like that movie of McFarland. Here's a bunch of Mexican kids who don't have a whole lot going on for them, coming together and going undefeated and uh, winning the conference title, et cetera. I ironically, the next year, the football team finally had some success and the community went absolutely nuts for us. <laughs> sure. Nobody said anything. Oh. Big deal. <laughs> was there things in the newspaper, do you think? Occasionally. Occasionally there were some things about the cross. But we were considered a, a weird group of skinny kids running around in their underwear at that time. Okay. In the mid-60s, guys were still throwing things at you as they rolled by. Beer cans, etc., pop cans. They'd be opening doors as they're coming at you because they think it's funny that you're out there. So running was not something that was widely accepted. Like I said, that meet in the North Coast Championships, there were only 300 kids at that race, but it was the biggest race I'd ever seen. Yeah. And normally a big race was like 75 kids because they'd have seven or eight teams here. How was the funding? Did you have spikes, quality shoes? <laughs> yeah, we grew up in the canvas tennis shoe era, Converse with that big ball gum sole at the front. No, uh, no heel support. Things were for us were atrocious. My first pair of shoes was a huge, very heavy pair of Wilsons, but that's all my mom could afford. And we had to go to another town to buy them. Equipment was lacking. We had those satin shorts, nothing really fit, mainly because we were so skinny and small. We didn't know any better. I had no idea 
how to train a year round because we were farm workers. So I worked the, the orchards and the crops during the summertime, but I was physically fit and always strong for my age. How, how did you get along with your coach? This new coach that came in with this new thing over the next few years working together. How was that relationship? Not great. He didn't really have time for me. It was interesting. Much later, he was very interested in what I became. I just remember that he wasn't real happy with some of us. Uh, we were checking out. He had a 57 Chevy, which made him a big stock stud on campus. And he was really angry that we had popped the hood and were looking at his engine and were marveling at how clean and everything was. And I didn't have a, a lot of rapport with him. Uh, the only thing that I really uh, remember is he made me very self-determined because the people on the team were saying, you, you're actually pretty fast. You, you're not as strong as the rest of us, but you're fast. So I challenged for the 880 relay team. And he said that I could do it. He put me through a workout that day. And then all of a sudden at the end of the workout, I'd been doing repeat 300. And he says, you can challenge for the relay today. And here I am at the end of the workout. I'm dead. <laughs> and not up. So he brings out this other kid and we put our starting blocks on this old cinder track. And we're going to run a 220. And this other kid knows how to use blocks. I have no idea really what I'm doing at this point. But I finish very strong and catch him and beat him at the line. So now I'm on the 8A relay team. He did do one good thing for us. He, he put us together and he taught us how to pass batons. His coach was Bud Winter, who was a great sprint coach. So he took all of his ideas. In 19, they introduced what's called the International Acceleration Zone. In other words, before you had to be inside the exchange zone to start and, and take the baton. Now they've given you an acceleration zone. The very first meet of the year, we introduce this concept and blow everybody out of the water and all the other coaches are up in arms. You can't do that. And they throw open the rule book and say, oh yeah, you can. And so wow. a relay. That is it. So that's that amazing. That's a cool moment. Yeah. That was the Hollister Relays, March, 1965. And we hit our baton exchanges perfectly. I remember with my teammates is that. We'd be walking up and down the halls of our school uh, during the lunch hour, and we'd be given our, our signal to, to take the baton. And we chose the, the Spanish word for today, hoy. So that was our command. We ran 129.6. In 1965, that's not bad. And we were blown away because it's also the same year that some team in New York, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that, but it, it, back on the East Coast, ran like 126.9 and we're going, oh my God, we were not the fastest team in the Valley, but we did well for ourselves. And I was very proud of the fact that uh, we competed as a group. And once again, the team was more than the sum of its parts. Rich, what leg did you run on that form person relay? Uh, I ran the third leg. They, back then you had to uh, break for the pool on the third. And because I was quick and fast and maneuverable, that was um, my option. And so I would take the baton and weave my way through the exchange zone because there's always guys running with you and hand it off to our anchor man, Dan Tracy. And Dan was a big, tall, strapping Irish kid. And I pride myself in the fact that our relay teams, both in high school and college, never dropped the baton. So, wow. Because I worked hard on it because I wanted to be the guy that they could count on. Good for you. What, do you remember, was that the starting line in the middle of the track or had they moved down towards the end yet? They had moved down towards the end at that point. Things were starting to change in 65. So that was good for us. But like I said, the, the uproar that went around that international exchange the acceleration right. zone was, was quite to do. It just something new and all of a sudden here's this uh, school taking advantage of that rule. Yeah. Did you master the blocks for other sprint races before you left high school? I tried and I, I did m more of it. And I, it took me almost four years to go back to it. I became a full-time sprinter my senior year in college. I did master the blocks, although it was probably the weakest phase of my running. 
I think the 200 would have probably been the best for me. I never got to run on artificial surfaces. I did it only once. And I lament the fact that I never got a chance to run on some of those really fast tartan tracks, et cetera. <laughs> but that's just our era. Let's get just a little bit more of your life background before we go from your transition high school to college. Your first language was Spanish? Correct. How were you as a student early and then by the time you graduate? How were your grades and how did you handle school? Long trajectory because I went through and got a master's degree. But as uh, elementary school, uh, I really didn't learn how to read well till at least the fourth grade. And that's really because I had um, a Latino teacher. Mr. Richard Flores was the coolest guy in the world to me because he had a T-bird. And he looked like me. And he introduced me to what was called the library. And he introduced me to the Donald Duck series. So I learned to read using those Walt Disney characters and the Donald Duck series. Then I discovered sports biographies. And I read every single one that I could get a hold of. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Roger Bannister. Everybody that I could get a hold of, I became a fanatic. And so I became a pretty good reader. But because I had missed a lot of the fundamentals in education, I really wasn't a very good student. I, there were things that I could do uh, that were interesting to me that I, as I grew up, I could do well. Um, they had an applied math or practical math you know, class that I did well in, but I wasn't good at, at theoretical math. History was something I really enjoyed because of sports heroes. They didn't have a class on car engines, unfortunately. Huh? You know, all those kind of things, but I got a decent education and I got better as I went through. In college, I struggled my very first year. I was even put, and folks think I'm kidding when they hear the name of my very first class in college, it was called Bonehead English. What was the name of the class? <laughs> and it was given to students that were remedial in their uh, English yeah. skills. And I progressively got better because I was more and more interested in what I was reading and doing in school and, and college gave you electives. So I became a much better student. And then I became almost a phenomenon in uh, my master's work because my professors couldn't believe the workload I was taking but also the stuff that I was into, because I was reading a lot of the Swedish research back in the early 70s on blood doping and what was going on there and the exercise physiology implications. Once again, I excelled as a graduate student. I was a slow starter and, and finished hard, like my races. <laughs> yeah, that's great when something interests you. It reminded me uh, that time in my little parochial school when I had to do the school work and I was a more behavioral issue, but I found a book on no hitters. And I said, can I do my book report on this? And once the teacher said, yes, I was like, oh my God, I can read whatever I want. They just want us to read. So I can relate to that. But you talked about your idea of you becoming a runner and then with the sectional meet success, you really cementing your identity. How did you get into college selection, pay for it? How did that transition work? It's an odd story. I wanted to stay local because I had a girlfriend. So I've been thinking about going to the local junior college because uh, I've applied to Santa Clara and I can't afford to go there and I can't get any uh, help. And all of a sudden, my dad decides he's going to send us back to our old hometown and show people that his oldest son can, in fact, go to school there. And so it's an ego thing for him. And lo and behold, the school accepts me. So I work my butt off all summer long, save up money. My parents give me a little money, but they're very poor. And I'm living in a 10 by 10 room with no heat, no running water, no facilities and one light bulb, and I'm walking over to campus, uh, which is a block away, and showering at the gym. I scraped enough money to buy a dining hall pass, so I'm eating, and I work my way through. I'm taking every odd job I can find. I made it through my freshman year. I'm voted the most valuable freshman on the cross-country team. Uh, I'm having success. I'm the third man. I'm doing well. Um, I'm, I'm plowing through my 
educational part, I'm still struggling educationally because this is all very new to me. Then my friends that I've made take me under their wing and say, there's ways of helping you pay for school. And so my coach takes an interest. They take an interest. So the next three years, I move on to campus. I excel in cross country and track and in the classroom. Everything is together. The whole idea of being a team, being part of something, all of a sudden it's, it's meshing very nicely for me. And Laverne was where Bob Richards was the reverend and he taught there. And that was the place that I first ran at that I got kicked off that track. <laughs> Which university was this and exactly where is it? It was called Laverne College in 1965, which is my freshman year of the fall. It's in the San Gabriel Valley, just a little southeast of Los Angeles. The schools that we competed against, most people have heard of. Whittier, Redlands, Pomona, Pitzer. One of the places that I really ran well was at Caltech. They were in our conference. And so wow. all these small schools are in a string, all within... 40 or 50 miles of one another from one end to the other. How far did you travel with the team? And what were the facilities and the coaching like then? The facilities were terrible. We had a dirt track. We didn't travel very far. The farthest I think we ever went was just down to India, just near the San Diego area. We never traveled very far, but there were plenty of meets to go to because Mount Sac Relays was just over the hill. And wow. the Long Beach yeah. relays were just 30 miles away. So we got a chance to meet uh, a lot of great competition locally. You've run a long time. Had you met with any injuries up through this point that were severe? I was having trouble. Back then, you basically, you were supposed to rub dirt on things and just muscle through it. And I was always having problems with my low back. Because we were farm workers and stoop labor. I'd created some issues for myself, my low back. Uh, it wasn't until years later when I had an MRI, I found out that I have a fused lumbar vertebrae by itself. Mm -hmm. It may have been because wow. I injured myself. I, I have a, a fractured wing uh, on, on that side, on the right side uh, near that area. And I have a split nerve in that same area. So I basically had to just deal with the injuries and I ran through almost everything. How'd you decide what the major in? I, my father wanted me to be a businessman and that was my declared major starting out. My coach inspired me to become a physical educator. He became my role model and my mentor. He knew very little in how to train an individual, but he was the most incredible motivator, mentor, an individual I'd have ever met. And he is so well thought of by so many of my classmates and peers. Uh, and that's what he could do. He could basically get you to believe in yourself and what you were capable of. And he was 100% support, supportive of what you wanted to get into. Do you think the relationship that he had with you is common with all your other teammates? Did he connect with you better or is that how everybody related to him? Everybody thought very highly of him. Uh, I will never know, but I know that he thought that I was special. His daughter told me that in our 50th little class reunion. She said she thought you were something. And I said, tearing up, I said, he meant the world to me. Very cool. What was your best accomplishments if you were going to put your CV in college, what was your best accomplishments there in, in well, track and cross country? As an undergrad, I think it was my sophomore year, I uh, set several course records uh, because things were just new in the area. Southern California cross country is really road racing. And so I have a very smooth, rhythmic step. I'm not very strong, but I'm very fast and I could finish very strongly. I had a great freshman and a part of my junior year. And that's when back issues started kicking in. Then my senior year, all of a sudden I'm switching to the shorter distances because it's much easier for me to cope with the discomfort and problems that I'm having by not having to put in the mileage. My coach is a hundred percent behind it. And I told his daughter this, I said, I'm not sure if he or I were more overjoyed 
when while tech, I broke 10 seconds for the hundred for the very first time. And then the coach from their program comes over and says, you just did something no one's ever done to Caltech because we have an atrocious dirt track. And I broke. Wow. So it was a track record too. It was a track record and it was my personal best at that point. And I continued to have great success. I anchored both relays, ran the 100, 200. We medaled and trophied at Mount Sac at some prestigious meets like Long Beach. And to me, that was fantastic. You're a physical education and science related with that part of your education. What about your nutrition? You got a meal pass, college food. <laughs> Were you paying attention to nutrition at all yet? Not at all. We basically ate everything in sight and never gave it a second thought. It was the first time I'd ever been introduced to salads and yogurt and things like that. But fresh fruit was something I'd grew, grown up with, but not as part of your meals. We really didn't give it second thought. We were eating in and out hamburgers, which are big on the West Coast and donuts and all that kind of stuff. Didn't really worry too much about it. I got introduced to weight training as a senior and I started doing that. And I started reading more and learning about drills and things like that. But no, my training was very rudimentary. My nutrition, my uh, knowledge of the sport was more historical than anything else. Because yeah. we had some incredible athletes in the area to read about. That's interesting. Other people at that era, especially sprinters, when they discover weight training, it's like, oh, now my times will come down. Not from the running training, but yeah, that more holistic approach. Had you been on the track or a cross-country course by the time you graduated with any women? Were there women's teams? What was women's sport track and cross country state by the time you graduated? Uh, non-existent. The only people that I knew about was there was a young lady named Margie Perez, who was uh, from one of the local communities. She was very quick and very fast, but never saw her compete, never knew anything other than the fact that she was a classmate and that she did do this, but didn't really ever go to a meet where I saw women compete that I can think of. I don't think, yeah, yeah I'm trying to think. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think there was any interaction whatsoever because back then volleyball, softball, uh, things like that were the only things that women did. When you graduated, I assume your father, the rest of your family, pretty proud. And the plan had worked out. What did you see your athletic career or activities would be once you graduated? I had no clue. All I did was put my nose to the grindstone. I was just going in one direction, get that degree. Cause I've been, obviously no one in my family had ever gone to college. Uh, my parents only went to elementary school. Uh, so uh, no one in in our extended family had ever done anything like this before. And here I was graduating in four years. Uh, if it hadn't been once again for my coach, I would never have given a second thought. He nominated me for a scholarship from the California Teachers Association. I was given the scholarship to work on my teaching credential. He gave me a job as his assistant coach. So now I have my path set for another year. He then, at the end of that year, put me in contact with the Peace Corps, and I became a Peace Corps volunteer because of him. Then, after I'm done with the Peace Corps, lo and behold, I find out I want to go to graduate school, and uh, the University of Colorado is willing to accept me and do all kinds of things in conjunction with my degree. I can coach, I can become an instructor. And I never realized all the connections till much later. So I found out his nephew and our star quarterback were on the CU football staff on one of the winningest teams in the country when I arrived at the University of Colorado. So they had already paved the way for me. He had obviously some, what's good work, reputation as knowing his athletes and knowing the people that he sends out. And when I arrived, they said, you can do this. Welcome. What was your Peace Corps experience like? It was short-lived. I got sick, but great. We were, our whole thrust was to help the North African country of Morocco get ready for the North African games. 
in track and field. They had focused wow. volunteers that could teach Olympic sports and track and field was one of them. I was part of a group that was agricultural, uh, kindergarten teachers and coaches. Did you learn a, a language before you went? We were thrust into full immersion in Arabic and French, primarily French for me. All right. I used to speak Arabic too. I don't know if that's gone from your brain. No, it, uh, it definitely is 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah. When did your running resume? It never stopped. Uh, fortunately, I ran through uh, my uh, graduate work and ran through the Peace Corps and then ran. When I arrived, um, it was just uh, something that I was able to keep on doing. I'm one of these guys that was blessed with a career that never forced me to stop because so many of my friends had the military, family, career, injuries, whatever. I never had to pause. Let's make sure everybody knows what city is CU in. It's in Boulder, Colorado, which was, became a hotbed. I yes, arrived in, in the fall of 1971 at the same time this other skinny guy, Frank Shorter, showed up. Did, when, did, how soon did you meet Frank? Almost immediately. He came into the track office, which I, I was a grad assistant, and was looking to use the indoor track. The coach at the time, head coach was Don Meyer, brought over and said, this is Frank Shorter. And so you might see him during your workouts. He wants to use the track. And I said, I don't know who Frank is. And he says, great. And that was it. That was our introduction. His wife was going to school in Colorado. And that's why he was on campus. Let's jump around through the 1970s because so much happened there. Maybe you can fill in the transition of the world if running through that decade, but you started the Boulder Roadrunners Club. You started the first women's cross country and track teams. There was so much that you were the pioneer from. Did you feel like a pioneer? Were the beer cans no longer flying out of the cars at you when you're on the road? What was the transition there that you saw? Boulder was about to explode as one of the four or five major running locations to be. What was going on for that whole decade for you? Well, running was basically, and well, track and field and cross country were my life at that point, because that's all that it revolved around that and my studies. Even my master's thesis is based on the, the sprint start. So everything revolved around that. I've got one of the fastest relay teams in the country. Uh, they ran 39.6 that year. Oh. Cliff Branch is on that team, runs 10 flat for 100 meters. I'm given all kinds of opportunities. I go to the first uh, Martin Luther King games in Philadelphia. I'm traveling with the team. I'm learning what it's like to get payments under the table uh, through some of the star athletes. Uh, the Colorado Track Club has been formed in Boulder. Uh, Jerry Quiller is a uh, force to be reckoned with because he's a coach on the staff and he's teaching me and sharing with me everything that he can. Uh, Don Myers is giving me all the support I could possibly ever want. The community is shed over heels with the fact that I am bilingual. I'm different. Uh, I want to be involved with the community. The university is enthralled with the fact that I have these international connections to the Peace Corps. So I'm getting a lot of opportunities. Folks think I'm making some of this stuff up, but all of a sudden the governor of the state contacts the university. The university president contacts my boss and says, we want this guy to go down and do a clinic in Mexico City. They're having a coaches thing and they're getting ready for the rural university game. So I'm going down there and I'm an exchange coach or whatever. They said, you did a great job for us. Governor calls once again and says, we want this guy to go do a clinic in Brazil at our sister state. And I said, Okay, the governor wants me to be part of this exchange program. So I'm going down to our sister state in Brazil. I'm making connections. What the university likes is the town and gown situation. And I should add that right after I got through with my graduate work, the university offers me a job in a new building called the Recreation Center. So I have the ideal job. They're sharing me with athletics. They love the partnership, uh, the community. Uh, loves the fact that I'm different. I'm probably the only Mexican in all three of the different categories across the board. 
uh, physical education, recreation, and athletics. I'm the person that's getting uh, a free hand at doing all this. How did you handle uh, Portuguese? I saw, was that the language in Brazil where you were? Yep. Um, they told me not to worry about the translator because I said, I can speak English to my translator, Emerson, and then he can tell you in Portuguese. I said, I do speak Spanish. And they said, we want you to speak Spanish and then we'll stop you if we can't figure out what you're saying. So they nicknamed it Portunal, a combination of the two. And so we got through the week just fine. Nice. Mm-hmm. All right. So you are being given these opportunities. Let me just ask specifically about the beginning of the women's programs. Yes. How did that okay. come about? Title IX has been uh, declared. It's a federal regulation. University is dragging its feet. They're not in compliance. They don't want to be in compliance. The athletic director is old school, a guy by the name of Eddie Crowder. And he was now deceased. Eddie's a football coach. He's the athletic director. And he says, I don't want a thing to do with you. And university president says, we have to. He says, you figure it out. And so he's got one of the best teams in the country. So he's got this leverage. The recreation center has opened. It's a few years old. And the president says, you guys are going to be under the recreation department. I'm on staff at the recreation center. My boss calls me in and says, we've been mandated just to house the, the new women's athletic program. We're going to start with um, a handful of sports, gymnastics, swimming, basketball, track and field. And I can't remember what the other one was, maybe softball. Uh, he said, you're the new track coach. And I said, what? He said, starting in the fall, you are the new cross country and track coach for women. He said, already, I'm letting you work with the men, just do the same thing with the women. What's our budget? Virtually nothing. So I go and start recruiting and building possible female participants. And lo and behold, we get a bunch to come to Colorado. My first recruit was a young lady named Cindy Icott at Daytona, Florida. And we still stay in contact. She's a wonderful young lady and very successful in life. So that's how the women's program got started because nobody else wanted them. And so I was a coach for two years, got them up off the ground. In our second year, Mary Decker joins our team and we finished third in the nation, Stephen F. Austin, in the AIW championships. And the next year we play host to the AIW championships in Denver. So we got off to a good start, and Colorado has obviously continued to do well on the collegiate team. I want to ask about your approach to coaching and how you related to coaching women, how people reacted to you. But first, what was your action after the 72 Olympics in Boulder and at the university with Frank Shorter's success? Obviously, the town was gaga. Frank and I had had some interaction. In fact, he gave me a tape of the race that, that ABC had given him a copy of that one and with commercials and everything, <laughs> and everybody wanted to meet Frank and be around him and running became a thing. Boulder was already a very active community and very sports oriented, a lot of mountain hiking and rock climbing and all kinds of stuff. Cycling was big. And so. This was just on top of everything else. It was the thing to be doing now. Let me ask you to, if it occurs to you as we go after Mary Decker and the other people coming into Boulder, the names that come that you remember when people come in, but that'll just come up as we talk and your stories. But how about you as a coach? How was your approach with meeting new athletes or gaining their trust? And how did that all go for you? When did you find the flow and the lane for that? Uh, I tried to emulate my coach in college, and I took an interest in the individual rather than just their performance. And uh, I'm still friends with a lot of the athletes that I worked with. That tells me at least I was partially successful. And many of them complimented me. And I've gotten some really great comments from kids much later on, and they're no longer kids. One of my former athletes, became the coach of the year for the state of New Mexico. He says, I used a lot of your workout. He says, what you taught us. And he says, I, I tried to emulate the way you approach things. And all I was trying to do was help them become the best person they could be 
And I was always open to new ideas. When people say, where'd you get that? I said, the drills that we started doing, I stole from a Polish coach in Canada. I would sit and talk to any coach who was willing to talk to me. I was borrowing ideas, using whatever I could come across in the literature, et cetera, and find out how can we do things a little bit better? How can we make this fun? And I found it is very fun talking with Rich Castro. That's it for part one. We'll continue with Rich next time in part two. I hope you enjoyed another episode of Running in the 70s. Voices, stories, and memories of athletes who were running in the 70s. Until next time, wherever you are, keep looking forward and don't forget to look back. (laughs) 